Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast, a weekly podcast for information security defenders, where we bring you discussions on best practices, tools, and implementation for enterprise security. Now, here are your hosts for today's show, Andy Ja and Adam Brewer. Welcome to another episode of the Blue Security Podcast. I'm Andy, your host. I'm Adam, your co-host. Welcome to Microsoft Ignite part two of our <laughs> series here. And if you haven't heard our episode from last week, I highly encourage you to go back and listen to it because there were a ton of really awesome announcements. And we're going to go over some more. Basically, these are things that I've picked out that I thought were really good things to know about because there were so many things we just couldn't fit into one show. And so we're going to go over some more things that I thought were really cool as part of Ignite. So the first thing we'll talk about is deception tactics. I saw this announcement actually from Heike, who is one of our Defender uh, security community uh, leaders. And I didn't see this as part of Ignite. The only reason why I saw it is because I follow her on LinkedIn and she posted that this was now in preview. You are now able to augment your EDR capabilities with deception tactics that's going to be natively integrated into Defender for Endpoint. So you're going to have the ability to create artificial attack surface that will entice your adversaries to access assets that you've created for them and trigger high fidelity early stage signals when accessed. There's going to be two types of uh, two types of attack services that you can create. Number one is decoys, which are fake assets that trigger an alert when an attacker engages, such as like a fake host or a fake user and then the other one is lures which are digital breadcrumbs that lead attackers to decoys and make them look more authentic such as files or batch files and other things so you might have like a file that's created by one of your fake hosts with those digital breadcrumbs and any interaction with them ensures immediate detection because the high fidelity alerts are created for the SOC and correlate into ongoing incidents so Deception technology that strategically complements EDR solutions and it can be a deciding factor on how much exposure your company has during a ransomware attack. I thought this was awesome because, you know, I've always thought about getting honeypots essentially. You know, there's canaries or whatever that you can buy. And I didn't think it was well spent money just because it's like one of those things that. You just put out there, and who knows how much that stuff costs. But now, if you're a Defender for Endpoint customer, this is just going to be integrated into your platform automatically, and you can just have it there sitting. And if an alert goes off, it's game on. It, it's funny you brought up Canary because I was sitting here trying to remember. What was that brand that used to advertise on Windows Weekly and other Twitch shows all the time? And by the way, shout out to Leo Laporte. Love love the network. Uh and and now just having it integrated, so much more helpful. And again, I, this is, goes back to some of the XDR discussion in part one, which if, if you didn't catch, you should go back to our week ago episode and listen first. But when you have all of these high fidelity telemetry based events correlated into a single incident, and then you prioritize incidents and you're able to enrich them with alerts that come from these honeypots, these decoys, that that is really, really valuable because now when an attacker gets that initial foothold in your environment, and let's say for whatever reason it didn't get the interest of the SOC, you haven't looked at it yet, and they start doing reconnaissance and they ping one of these decoys, all of a sudden that alert is going to shoot up to the very top of the list because you have an incredibly high fidelity alert that says, Something not right is going on because nobody should be pinging this thing internally to the environment because nobody knows about it or cares about it. The only person who would be is an attacker trying to look around. And that's just that's just awesome. But it gets complemented even more when it's contextualized and in line with the rest of the broader XDR story. So very, very cool. Look forward to unpacking this more. Moving on to cloud solutions like you know within azure because of how complex multi-cloud environments and cloud native applications are 
you need to have a comprehensive strategy that enables code to cloud defenses on all cloud deployments. And so a lot of organizations are using code to cloud type infrastructure, infrastructure as code. And for posture management, one of the announcements was preview of Defender for Cloud's integration with Microsoft Entra Permissions Management. If you're not familiar with Entra Permissions Management, it was one of our acquisitions called CloudNox, which we've rebranded as Permissions Management. And that helps you discover least privilege um, or helps you implement least privilege principle by looking at your users in multi-cloud situations, Google Cloud, AWS, Azure, because it was an acquisition, it is platform agnostic. And so it can look at the least or the permissions that you've assigned to users and how often they use them, when they use them, and basically help you scope down to least privilege. Because if you have a user that hasn't used their admin privileges for months, then there's probably no reason for that user to have it in the first place. So now you're able to use Defender for Cloud and be able to show links between access and potential vulnerabilities across Azure, AWS, and Google Cloud. It also has an improved attack path and um, analysis experience. This was previewed back um, a few months ago, but now there are more, um, more features as part of it to help you predict and prevent complex cloud attacks. It helps you provide insights into your Kubernetes deployments across Amazon's uh, Elastic Kubernetes service and Google Kubernetes engine clusters and API insights to help you prioritize cloud risk mitigation. There's also some new capabilities to help you strengthen security throughout your application lifecycle with a preview of GitLab Ultimate integration, and that'll help you give a clear view of your application security posture and simplify your code to cloud remediation workflows across all major developer platforms from GitHub to Azure DevOps to GitLab within Defender for Cloud. And then finally, general availability for Defender for API, which offers machine learning driven protection against API threats, agentless vulnerability assessments for container images in Microsoft's Azure container registries. So a ton of stuff there when it comes to multi-cloud, CNAP, cloud native applications that simply if you're in that type of business, you need to have some sort of strategy for it. And really there were a ton of announcements around this. Defender for Cloud had a great Ignite as well. <laughs> and I think one thing we touched on last week is also, or maybe we didn't touch on it, but there is growing integration between Defender for Cloud and also uh, Defender XDR. And, and some of that is, is being built as well. But what's interesting here, like you talked about Entra Permissions Management, which is a class of product known as CIEM, or Cloud Infrastructure Entitlement Management, and Andy described it really well, looking across AWS, Azure, GCP, analyzing your permissions, and using activity to make recommendations. This never gets used. Perhaps they don't need it. And helping prevent permissions creep over time. It actually has a permissions creep index as part of it and can help you peel that back. And so you don't have permission creep and you have really tightly scoped permissions. And now that, what's changing here is that's gonna be integrated with Defender for Cloud which is both a CSPM as well as CWPP. So CSPM, Cloud Security Posture Management, and CWPP, Cloud Workload Protection Platform. Well, now in Defender for Cloud, as I'm working other recommendations or posture management advice in there, I will also see some of the permissions management suggestions. Hey, you should remove permissions for this user because on, on this resource because they don't use this thing. And like everything in Defender for Cloud, Andy, you said it's only because it's an acquisition. Actually, no, Defender for Cloud's whole strategy is to be multi-cloud and even hybrid cloud as well. So you can onboard your on-premise servers to Azure Arc, and then cloud security posture management recommendations will bubble up in Defender for Cloud as well, even for your on-prem servers. So uh, a ton of value there to make Defender for Cloud kind of your center of your universe to protect all of your public cloud and even 
hybrid cloud on-prem. Um, and, and so then you kind of walk through the rest of it, some of the interesting additional integrations like Defender for API is generally available. Um, and, and it improved attack path analysis. Really cool stuff because sometimes it's hard for us as defenders, Andy, I think you talked about this when we were doing a, um, a prep call for a, a future collaboration show we're going to do, preview there. Uh, you mentioned that sometimes it's hard for you as a blue hat person and me as well to think creatively around how would I perpetrate an attack and having that computerized attack path management to basically visualize how would someone move throughout the environment and here's ways you might want to cut them off preventatively is really, really helpful. And when you integrate that again with some of the entitlement management capabilities there of reducing the permissions creep, that's going to help you reduce those attack paths as well. So it kind of that virtuous cycle of integration, whereas it gets more integrated, you get a better, more holistic view of all the actions you need to take to harden and protect your environment. Some announcements around Microsoft Defender Threat Intelligence, which is now going to be built into the XDR platform. If you're not familiar with that, it was another acquisition that we have rebranded and started slowly integrating into all the products. That was a risk IQ passive total um, a acquisition a few years ago. And so now there's going to be a blade of threat intelligence within Defender XDR that has things like detonation intelligence, which enables users to look up, search, and contextualize cyber threats, as well as detonate URLs and view the results quickly to understand a malicious file or URL. That is huge because I always went to different places to do that, right? Like you would open up some sort of external website to look and see if this URL is malicious or this file hash is malicious. Now you have that built in to the Defender XDR with a, a separate blade. You can also quickly submit an indicator of compromise and immediately view the results. That is huge. Think about how many times your CISO, your board, your CEO sees something in the news and they're like, is our company going to be vulnerable to this? And then you're struggling. You're like taking a look at everything, searching through the logs. Maybe you have no idea where to start. Well, guess what? You can just then submit an IOC into the threat intelligence blade and ask, is our company vulnerable to this? There's also vulnerability profiles that are going to put intelligence collected from the threat intelligence team. This is just stuff about CVEs, about different threat attack groups that you can then go and check out. Like this group is focusing on this type of attack and these are the things that you should patch in order to prevent that. And it'll have these vulnerability profiles all built in. So threat intelligence, a huge part of security. It's something that I think a lot of defenders don't have time to really read about and figure out. And so now I think with all the different co-pilot integrations with this threat intelligence built into the XDR uh, platform, you can ask it things like, tell me if this IP address is malicious. Tell me where else this malicious file shows up, things like that, that will help you search at machine speed, all the different vulnerabilities that you have, your attack surface and so on and so forth. The acquisition of risk IQ cost quite a pretty penny. And after the acquisition was completed, Microsoft sold and still sells a Microsoft Defender Threat Intelligence solution. And it's something you can talk to your Microsoft account team about, but there is a, a definite cost associated with that. And we are taking parts of that solution and integrating them throughout the stack at no additional cost to existing users. Now, um, Microsoft is run by staunch capitalists and is a publicly traded company and is a fiduciary responsibility to our shareholders to deliver and maximize shareholder value. That all said, it is notable that this is just kind of being rolled in, uh, something that has a lot of value and customers definitely do pay money for is being rolled out to more customers at no, no additional cost. And there's other ex examples of this as well. Like we have announced that Defender Threat Intelligence will be included with the Security Copilot Early Access Program. 
I don't know if we've announced yet if it will be included when that becomes generally available, but that is notable that we are including it in the early access program. So it's just one of those things where threat intelligence is so valuable and helps protect the world that it's one of those things where we want to get it in the hands of as many folks as possible. Sometimes you just do the right thing because it's the right thing to do. I look at, um, if you ever get the chance to go to an executive briefing at our executive briefing center in Redmond, it's an incredible experience. But one of the things we often do as part of executive briefings is we take a, a field trip to our digital crimes unit. And the Microsoft Digital Crimes Unit uh, helps do things like shut down these, these, bat, these threat actors, these attack groups through novel legal means, like using the court system to take possession of a domain name and then redirecting it to a non-malicious source instead of command and control servers. Or a lot of what the Digital Crimes Unit is help shut down child pornography rings and, and prevent that heinous behavior from continuing. And, and it's one of those things that Microsoft does it because we have the ability to do it. We have the breadth and depth and visibility and, and financial means to accomplish that. And so it is genuinely a giving back to the world, helping protect the world thing that we do just because we can and just because we should. And so I'm encouraged to see more of the world-class threat intel, and we're making it available to more customers at no additional cost because it's going to help secure the world and secure our customers, which we all benefit from. As we say on this show all of the time, cybersecurity is a team sport. So I love this announcement. Another really, really cool announcement was extending purview data protections across structured and unstructured data. So now users will have the ability to discover, classify, and safeguard sensitive information hosted in structured databases such as Microsoft Azure SQL and Azure Data Lake Storage and extending these capabilities into Amazon Simple Storage Service Buckets or S3 Buckets. I saw an example of this where... There was data that was stored in Azure. It was classified under purview information protection. And then when that was moved over to an Amazon S3 bucket, those data protection labels traveled with it natively. And so they, they stayed in there. And how it does it is that it doesn't translate the label. It's not the exact same label. It looks at what the Amazon way, the AWS way of that classification and applies that classification to it. So the teams have worked together to basically translate what you want within Azure over to AWS with the same native protections in AWS. Very, very cool, especially for those who not only have structured data, but also unstructured data within these databases. I think there's sometimes a misconception that the whole purview information protection story is only for unstructured data and maybe even more specifically only for Microsoft file types. Well, A, that's actually never been true. It's, it's always extended to almost any arbitrary unstructured file type. But for several years now, since the launch of a, a product called Azure Purview a couple years ago, there's been a story around extending that into structured data that lives in Azure infrastructure or Azure PaaS. And this is exciting to see it extended further, but this is actually not like a net new product. This is net new capability into an existing product. So if you did not know that you can extend purview beyond just that kind of traditional Microsoft 365 sense of the world and Office Docs and all that, but all the way into your infrastructure, into your uh, platform as a service offerings as well, where you, wherever you have structured data living, and not just in Azure, but as Andy mentioned, now some AWS integration as well, uh, then, then you should talk to your Microsoft account team because we've got a whole setup there with Azure Data Map and, and those sorts of things as well. So uh, definitely a story around structured data, and it all ties together like Andy mentioned, uses the same set of labeling, the same taxonomy, the same classifications, just implemented in a different way because, of course, the solutions are different. So really cool stuff. Definitely check out more if that's something that's applicable to your organization. 
some more purview announcements with Insider Risk. So now Insider Risk Management, which is part of Purview, offers ready-to-use risk indicators to detect critical insider risk in Azure, AWS, and SaaS applications, which include, drum roll please, because this is something that has been asked for for a very long time, Box, Dropbox, Google Drive, GitHub, and so on and so forth. So admins with the appropriate permissions will no longer need to manually cross-reference signals in these environments that can now utilize the curated and pre-processed indicators to obtain a holistic view of potential insider incident. Massive, massive win for those defenders on information protection. I think ever since the SolarWinds incident, we've been asking ourselves, and by the way, here's how fast time moves in cybersecurity world. That was three years ago. Ever since that happened, we've been asking ourselves, how do we get a better visibility into and sense of when we could have those type of supply chain attacks where something malicious is injected in our code? Because that's what happened at SolarWinds. And so extending insider risk capabilities to GitHub, that's the one I was listening for, Andy, when you rattled them off and predicting or surfacing that behavior and being able to flag it and call it out. Not to say this is the silver bullet that we have solved these sorts of things, but it's another tool in the toolbox to maybe help alert us to those sorts of threats. And that's really, really helpful because when insider risk is happening, it's not just in SharePoint, OneDrive and Teams. It's going to be in whatever application makes the most sense for whatever organization is under attack. And so extending that visibility into infrastructure, into third-party SaaS applications, massive win for insider risk and really delivering that holistic visibility you need. Now, as part of Ignite, again, if you're a listener of the show, you know that Adam and I come from identity and endpoint management. There were a ton of Entra announcements, so I wanted to dedicate some time to Entra. First, I wanted to talk about Entra private access and internet access, which we had talked about before. It's in preview right now, but there are some new things that are coming to it. I didn't really understand the Entra internet access previously because I was trying to figure out where we were going with this. Now I understand the purpose of it. And really, it's to enable orgs to enforce network-based conditional access, no matter what type of identity provider you're using, without any changes to the application. Think about how you're enforcing conditional access. A lot of organizations say, must come from our corporate IP, right? And so if your organization's compromised, your network's compromised, then all of a sudden you've provided a condition that gets bypassed because... Attackers are coming from your corporate IP. Now, this intra internet access is a Microsoft proxy. The chances of that getting compromised are very slim. I'm not going to say zero, but near zero. It's, it's going to be pretty hard to compromise because it's a Microsoft network. And so now you can provide a network-based conditional access. Must be coming from intra internet access to app- access this application. Right? So it's another layer of conditional access that has to be satisfied in order to access a certain thing. Maybe you don't do, enable it for everything. Maybe for Azure admin access must have enter internet access enabled. Well, when it first launched in preview, it was only for M365 apps. Now we're expanding the capability to all internet apps with some additional capabilities like contextually aware um, secure web gateway with web content filtering so that you can restrict end user access to unsafe non-compliant content, as well as universal conditional access. I don't know a ton about this. I wanna research more, and I'm sure we're gonna have a little bit more of a conversation on the show later shows about this, but extending adaptive access controls to any network destination, such as an external website or non-federated SaaS app. So I'm trying to like figure out, you can provide conditional access to something that is not federated with Azure. That's kind of blowing my mind a little bit, but it makes sense if you have control of the gateway, the network gateway that you can say, okay, you must have conditional access to get to this website, right? A non-federated SaaS app. 
like say, I, I mean, just using like CNN, for example, right? Like you must have conditional access <laughs> to get to CNN. I don't know why you would do that, but you know, whatever. So that is a little bit crazy to me. Um, compliant network checks, right? So easy to manage and construct conditional access with um, uh, to be able to check whether or not your, your network is compliant and you can protect intra integrated cloud applications against token theft and ensure that users don't bypass network security controls that are specific to their tenant. Also, source IP restoration in ID protection and conditional access location policies They'll maintain the user's original source IP to enable backward compatibility of trusted location checks and continuous access evaluation, identity risk detection, and logging. So a lot of cool things. I was thinking this was going to be more of a filter because I was familiar with Zscaler internet access. I mean, obviously you're filtering out like malware and all sorts of other things, but there are some really cool identity things about this, which is conditional access. So not only like universal conditional access, but network-based conditional access. So really cool stuff coming there. And then enter uh, private access. That's more, you know, building on our app proxy, but expanding it to not only 443 and port 80, but there's going to be more supports for protocols in addition to TCP, including UDP, private DNS. You'll be able to transition from your traditional VPN to a modern zero-trust network architecture solution or ZTNA. There's going to be conditional access controls for modern authentication methods, such as, again, drum roll, please, multi-factor authentication to secure access to private applications and resources for remote and on-premise users. Did you catch what I said there, Adam? On-premises users. MFA for <laughs> on-premise resources. Mm -hmm. We have been asking for this. For so many years, you know, I've talked to so many customers of like Duo and Ping and they're like, we can't move away from this because we have MFA for our servers on-prem and we haven't been able to do that. And now with EPA or Enter Private Access, we're going to be able to provide those conditional access policies with MFA to on-premise resources and on-premise users. Huge, massive. And so these SSE solutions or secure security edge, whatever you want to call it, will work with existing security network solutions. In fact, we announced a partnering ecosystem that's going to work side by side with like a partner like Netscope. And then there's going to be cross client OS support as well. So Windows and Android is in public preview and Mac and iOS are in public. Uh, so Windows and Android are in public preview and Mac OS and iOS are in private preview. And it's available globally with the exception of China and Russia. And I know I get this question a lot when I used to deploy Zscaler is where is that proxy location going to be? In fact, one of the funny things is I used to get a question from like one of the European countries because their traffic was getting proxied to say France or Germany, but they lived in Spain and there wasn't an endpoint in Spain. So when they went to Google and it would you know, instead of going to like the Spain's Spanish Google, it would go to France or Germany. And so having those endpoint destinations is going to be important. I don't know how many we have, but there are more locations coming. I did see that, you know, it's important to note that China and Russia are actually excluded from this currently. Um, so for obvious reasons, I think. Um, but those are huge. Um, I'll pause there because that was a lot. I'll let you. Uh, Give your thoughts on that, Adam. Very competitive space. I think Microsoft's bringing some differentiation to these solutions, in particular, the integration with your existing conditional access as your control plane is really valuable because you're not creating multiple control planes. And anytime you have multiple control planes, it gets confusing because it's hard to tell what control plane is doing this thing and where do I need to build the policy and what control plane. So having conditional access be the control plane for enter internet access, enter private access, everything flowing through enter ID. Very, very, very powerful. Uh, love anything that helps people get rid of VPNs. So thrilled about that. And um, just really wanted to speak to this, something you mentioned, you were talking about the availability of, of 
the service and the network points of presence and all that. And so while I can't speak to the very specific detail ex example you gave of like the Spain versus France thing, what I can say is Microsoft has one of the largest private fiber networks in the world. I don't know if it's the largest anymore, but it is one of the largest. And we have points of presence in almost every part of the globe. And so if there is ever an organization you want to work with for something like this, a company that has a massive amount of private fiber to run and all this traffic over is going to be highly beneficial because it's going to be able to ingress close to the user and then traverse over private fiber and egress close to the destination and deliver in highly performant, highly secure experience. So I think compared to almost any other vendor here, I, I mean, again, it's, it's one of those, Zscaler makes a great product. They're a Microsoft partner. I'm not denigrating them, but who do you think has access to more points of presence and more private fiber, Microsoft or Zscaler? I, I think the answer is kind of obvious there. So I, I think you're going to have a great experience and, and, and really not run into some of those same issues you may have seen in the past, but really, really thrilling stuff. Again, anything that hastens the demise of the VPN, I am cheering like crazy. That can't come soon enough. And I'll be interested to see when that happens for us because at Microsoft, we still have a VPN. Now, to be fair, we almost never have to use it today because almost all of our apps are app proxied. There are a couple of laggard systems that still require it. And we have a manual Global Protect VPN you have to fire up for those circumstances. So the day of that's demise, I will cheer um, and maybe share that news on the show as well. But yeah, really cool stuff. I, it's just nice to hear it fleshed out more because these got announced several months ago. Uh, I want to say in July or maybe early August. And it was kind of light on detail. So as Ignite happened and we got a lot more detail on this, you start to see, okay, I really see the value here. This is cool. I can think of examples where organizations would want to use this. And one thing we didn't really get into on here a whole lot, but I'll just point out if this rings a bell for any of our listeners, if you're doing tenant restrictions, tenant restrictions V1 is kind of this ugly solution where you have to run all of your Microsoft destined traffic back on premises, crack open the headers, inject this thing into the headers to ensure that you have tenant restrictions in place. And it basically runs counter to our guidance, which says you should split tunnel your traffic and all Microsoft 365 traffic should, or Azure traffic for that matter, should egress directly to Microsoft. And if you're doing tenant restrictions, it's like, LOL, just kidding, hairpin that back on prem, crack it open and add this header. Well, Tenant Restrictions V2 is in preview. And one of the ways you can do it is through the Windows operating system. But the really cool way to do it, where you can extend it to any platform, any device from anywhere, is through intra internet access and intra private access. So if tenant restrictions is something you're doing today and something you want to do tomorrow, but want to expand that to other platforms or want to eliminate these silly network dependencies, well, here's your answer. And I only know this because I've been talking about tenant restrictions recently with another customer. So very cool stuff here and excited to continue to watch these products develop and proceed to public preview in GA. Some other cool enter announcements. There's going to be some automatic rollout of conditional access policies. So last year, security defaults were turned on for almost 7 million tenants, and that has reduced their attack surface by up to like 80%, I think was the number. Now Microsoft is auto-enrolling eligible tenants into conditional access policies, starting with three that will enforce MFA in high-risk scenarios. There's a Alex Weinhardt post that will be in the show notes that you can read all about it. But basically the three are, and again, these are for eligible uh, customers. Some of them are for all and some of them are require some licensing. So the first one is multi-factor authentication for admin portals. Every single customer is going to have that enabled by default. Obviously you can turn it off or if you have something already in conditional access that overrides it, then you already have it. But if you don't have it, it will be turned on by default. The other one will be multi-factor authentication for per-user multi-factor authentication users. 
I don't know of many of these that are still around, but existing per user multi-factor authentication customers um, will have a policy applied that will require multi-factor authentications for all cloud apps. So I think this is for customers that don't have conditional access enabled or maybe aren't licensed for conditional access. It might be that old school office multi-factor auth that will now just be turned on by default for everyone instead of waiting for the admins to do it. And then finally, multi-factor authentication for high-risk users will be enabled by default. And this is going to be for Entra ID P2 customers, which requires risk-based conditional access. And so high-risk users will automatically be required to MFA. So a couple of default conditional access policies Again, the tyranny of the default, right? If it's not turned on by default, oftentimes most people don't go and do it. When you finally do it by default, then the majority of people won't go and turn it off. So I think this is a good thing for everyone. These are absolutely cases that you want to use MFA for. If you go read Alex Weinert's post, which we will link in the show notes, he does some great storytelling in it. And what he does is talk about what happened with MSAs or Microsoft accounts for consumers. These are the things you use for your personal Microsoft 365 for families account or your Xbox account. And he walks through how there were objections to doing things like requiring multi-factor authentication for MSAs. And then he walks through the statistics of after they enabled it, the amount of threats that dropped. And, and the storytelling here is essentially that one of the challenges we constantly run into is we actually have really, really, really great metrics for our consumer accounts and how secure and safe they are. And I think Microsoft has been an absolute leader in that space. I talked on a previous show when we talked about pass keys, how Microsoft accounts have allowed a true password list where you can literally delete your password and not have one for years. And I was bemoaning how Google still made me type in a freaking password all the time and finally rolled out pass keys recently. Uh, but, but we really had a leadership position in consumer facing accounts is my point. And he talks about how with enterprises, how they're kind of going through a lot of these same concerns just multiple years later. Whereas we added multi-factor authentication to all Microsoft consumer accounts like five, six, seven years ago, a lot of admins are still going through that today because they're worried about, oh, is there too much friction? Oh, is there this? Oh, is there that? Despite the evidence that it reduces risk of compromise by 99%. And so I would say our identity team has taken a stronger stance recently where they're going to start enforcing defaults that do the right thing. And if customers want to get grumpy about it, we will give them the ability to opt out. But like Andy, you talked about the tyranny of the default. It is so important to protect the world, to protect Microsoft, to protect customers from themselves, that we start getting these defaults to a more sensible place. And so there were a couple of changes in the recent past, which we discussed on this show. First one was where we started enforcing the most strong sign-in authentication method as the default. So in the past, the behavior was the last successful method would default the next time. So for example, if you signed in and said, send me an SMS text message with a code, and that was successful, the next time you signed in, we'll say, ah, we'll send you a text, which is default. The behavior change became, we're going to use the most strong one. So if you had a security key registered, we're going to default to that. If you have authenticator app registered, then that would be the second choice and so on. And then phone-based sign-in methods would be like the very bottom because they suck and we don't want to use those if we can not avoid it. And so that rolled out like in July. Then more recently in September, we enforced a registration campaign where users who were only using phone-based sign-in methods, we would start to prompt to say, you need to register the authenticator app. And if... um. You know, they'd get a couple of times to, to put it off, but eventually they had to do it. And so, of course, I got lit up from some customers about this. Now, to be fair, we communicated the heck out of these. They were in documentation. They were on the identity blog. But most importantly, 
and this is the one you need to pay attention to. They were in the Microsoft 365 Message Center, and that is where all breaking changes are communicated to customers. Now, if you are blindsided by a change that we communicate through the Microsoft 365 Message Center, then let me be blunt. You're not doing your job, or somebody's not doing their job. It is a requirement, or it should be a requirement at least, as an M365 customer that someone is monitoring the message center and is triaging the messages and getting them to the system owners. So if you were blindsided by those changes and these upcoming changes, by the way, you're hearing about them on the show and you didn't already get the message center message about them, then you need to take control of your message center. And my favorite way to do it, and we can link to this in the show notes, there's integration between message center and planner to where you can make it that every message that comes into message center generates a task in planner. Now what you do is you assign a system owner that acts as the dispatcher and they go through every single task in planner and assign it to a system owner. This is for exchange. This is for SharePoint. This is for identity. And now they have a task in their planner that they have to basically check off that they looked at and they did. And now you no longer run into those scenarios where it's like, man, I didn't know about this because you did know about it. You checked off that you knew about it at this time and you were able to plan for change. So it's just one of those things where I am sensitive to the fact that these changes don't work for all organizations. For example, one of the customers that express concerns um, is a real estate company and they're very sensitive to how their real estate agents are uh, changed or interacted with. I get it. They're, they're not employees. You know, they're, like non-captive contractors of yours, for lack of a better term. You don't want to enforce stuff like this. Okay, that's fine. You could opt out of it, but you needed to know about it, which means you need to manage Message Center. So these changes are coming. I think they're super positive, and they're really common sense, and you can read more about them because I believe, Andy, if I'm not mistaken, these are initially going to be turned on in an audit mode before they even get enforced. So... Learn more about them. If you need to opt out of them, do that. But the real message here is we are going to take steps to secure our identity platform. Um, We really hope customers come on the journey with us. If you want to back out of changes because you need to or they're not appropriate, that's fine. You can opt out of them always, but just make sure you're keeping up with us. And the the best way to do that is A, bookmark the identity blog because it's awesome, but B, make sure you've got really strong process around the M365 message center. I knew you were going to bring that up, Adam. It's one of your favorite topics to talk about is the message center. <laughs> and since you went on a tangent about that, I wanted to just fill in with one of my own uh, stories because I recently went to a conference uh, in Atlanta called the Experts Conference, which is hosted by Quest. And it's a phenomenal conference. If you have a chance to go to, if you're a Microsoft admin, it's absolute uh Great content, super technical, but we had one of the engineering PMs there from Microsoft who gave a talk on their project over three years of disabling legacy authentication within Exchange. And they talked about how many times they sent messages in the message center and they have metrics on how many people read the messages. And not to anyone's surprise, if you're not reading the message center, you are not alone because it was a high, like 70, 80% of people did not read that legacy authentications were getting turned off. And so, you know, not, not to belabor the point, but um, it was just interesting hearing him talking about it because a lot of the decisions that were made were, let's just go ahead and turn it off and see how much of a ruckus it causes and how many people um, complain about it and a lot of times nobody even noticed. So um, yeah, definitely read the message center. It's one of the most important areas of communication when it comes to Microsoft's like roadmap and features that are happening. And the message center is specific to your environment. So the other thing we will do there are like security incident notifications. If you've ever seen us say like there was this incident and a certain number of customers were impacted Impacted customers are notified by the message center. So it's specific to you. 
And sometimes when there's changes where we know like when your tenant's going to be impacted, we will tell you there because that's our way of doing that. So it, it, it's, yeah, I'm sure the percentage of folks who read it is small because I, I saw how many people were blindsided by these changes, but it's, it's one of the things of that is the way. And it may not be the security team's job to own that, but it needs to be someone's job. And so I think of back when I was in enterprise IT, my colleague and I, we were the M365 system owners, and we took a great amount of pride in how on top of changes we were. We always knew what was coming. We always knew what was getting turned on, and we were always in front of it. And so it is possible to do. I get the rate of change is big, but there are tools to help manage it. And, and you really have to do that because we really are trying to deliver a more secure, better service for everyone. And unfortunately, sometimes that's going to involve changing behavior, changing defaults, having changes that impact customers because we're trying to make it better. It's just, you, you know, you, you can't make an omelet without breaking a few eggs sometimes. All right. The show is getting a little bit long, but I do want to talk about these <laughs> last few things because I think they're awesome. Number one, Entra ID users will be able to use pass keys that are managed from the Microsoft Authenticator app. So the Microsoft Authenticator app will be supporting pass keys um, for applications. Microsoft Entra ID protection will now detect anomalies for unusual token lifetime or token played from un unfamiliar locations. So if an alert is triggered, conditional access can immediately expire the token, force a reauthentication along with other measures like a password reset or step of MFA without requiring any type of manual intervention. Again, your admins are not always online. A lot of times they're asleep. You know, what happens if you have global um, users? You know, some of these things happen overnight. And so not having, um, you know, having the ability to basically not require manual intervention is huge. Finally, again, this is a big one that I wanted to, that I found. And now if a user makes a password change on-prem, Enter ID protection can automatically remediate the risk. So what happened in the past was hybrid customers um, who do password changes on premises found it challenging to enable user risk policies. So using intra risk policies for users, they would have problems with it because if a user um, would get blocked from an on um, from becoming risky, uh, they would not be able to self remediate by resetting their password on premises because the password change wasn't visible to enter ID. So you couldn't dismiss the risk. It made it, made it really challenging for customers to take advantage of enter ID protection signals and leverage those risk-based policies to protect their hybrid tenants. Now, to bridge that gap, Microsoft is introducing a new setting called allow on-premise password change to reset user risk and enter ID protection. So customers that have Password hash synchronization enabled on their tenants will now be able to enable the setting. And when it's enabled, user risk will be automatically re remediated when their password is changed on premises. So customers can now confidently deploy user risk policies to protect their hybrid users. This is a massive and awesome change. So, I mean, overall, I am just floored. And this is just a scratch in the surface of all the things that were announced. I just sorted through a ton of information, found stuff that I found was interesting, but there were so many security announcements. Highly recommend if you have the time to take a look at some of the links that we put in our, um, in our show notes, as well as watch some of the uh, recorded videos or they're on YouTube under Microsoft. There's probably going to be more that are released, but this was probably one of the best if not best, as far as security announcements I have seen for Ignite in many, many years. It was an amazing Ignite. It, just to wrap up on a couple of things you said, I laughed out loud when I saw the Passkey integration with Authenticator app because we just did a show on Passkeys either a week ago or two weeks ago, and I was lamenting that I hadn't really gotten into Passkeys yet because they didn't know what my strategy was. They didn't know where I wanted to manage them. And this just gives me another option for it. So that was cool. Uh, the, the token 
unusual token lifetime or token played from an unfamiliar location. There's been some detections in that in Entra ID protection for a while, but now having automated remediation, as Andy talked about, not just because your admins aren't always online, but because threats happen so fast, we need to move at machine speed to prevent them or remediate them. This is incredible, where if a user does fall victim to an evil jinx style attack, now we can potentially detect that token being replayed from a weird place and just saying, eh, nope, you, you're going to have to uh, reauthenticate with other measures to get back in because we saw this and this is weird. So that is really cool stuff. And then, yeah, just walking through that scenario, you talked about doing password changes on premises. Let me just simplify that even further. You're not using the Entra ID self-service password reset. You're doing it any other method. That's when you need what Andy just walked through. Because if you go through self-service password reset, of course, Entra ID could see it and it could use that to say, oh yeah, they've remediated it, reset their risk. If you do it through other means, it wouldn't know necessarily that that was the result of that. And that's why, by the way, this is opt-in. You have to check that box to turn it on. Because if you are using SSPR, you may not want to enable this because that might be in a way for an attacker to essentially relax the, the uh, controls against them. But if this is how you do password reset or you use another solution to do password reset, then you, this is highly beneficial because you get the benefit of being able to enforce user risk controls um, without that scenario where a user could get into a degraded state and, and basically not be able to get themselves out of it with self-service remediation. So um, very, very cool stuff. Just, man, like you said, Andy, I've been at Microsoft almost seven years now. Easily the biggest, most comprehensive Ignite I've ever seen in terms of announcements. I mentioned on our part one <laughs> when we talked about this that I thought this was the culmination of consolidating Microsoft's engineering under one single leader who reports directly to the CEO. And I think you're starting to see that bear fruit. And just to give you an idea, listeners, of how much material there was, Andy picked out the highlights. And we usually like our shows to maybe be 35, 30 minutes of recorded time, which Andy edits down to be a little shorter. Both of these episodes topped the 50-minute mark. And we did two of them because there's so much to talk about. And we could easily do another couple of shows on other announcements as well. So tons to cover, um, tons of links in the show notes. Start to chew on this, start to dig through it. And by the way, lots of great sessions that weren't just like product announcement sessions, but actually like implementation sessions. How do I do this? How do I make this work? What does Microsoft do to protect their environment? What are best practices to implement purview? Lots of great material. So check it out, not just product announcements, but ways that are really actionable to help you protect and secure your own environment. Well, that's our show for this week. Thanks for watching as always. Our contact information will be in the show notes if you have any questions or topics you want us to talk about in the future. Thanks, and we'll talk to you guys next week. Thank you for listening to the Blue Security Podcast. Please check out the show notes, catch up on episodes you may have missed, and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Find Andy on Twitter at AJAWZERO and Adam at AJ Brewer. See you at our next episode.